My name is Amanda Benton, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 2011. We're very excited to present this webinar to you today in conjunction with the Hudson River Valley Institute featuring Dr. James Johnson and Dr. Betsy Blakesley. Um, if you encounter any audio issues, you do have the option to dial in by telephone. That number and code are in the chat box. Due to the number of participants today, we have muted all lines except for the host. So you'll have two options for communicating with us. You can use the chat for any technical questions you have or general questions you have for the Marist staff who are listening. We ask that you do not send private messages to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Blakesley. You can use the Q&A features for questions that you have about the presentation and be sure to direct your questions to the host so that we can compile them and um, ask them at the appropriate time. There are several ways you can view this presentation on your screen. If you hover over the top right corner of the video portion with your mouse, small icon should appear. The preferred choice for a webinar like this that includes both slides and video is side-by-side -side view. There will be a brief survey on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar. It should pop up as a new tab in your browser. And if you have a minute, it would be extremely helpful for us to hear your feedback. So now, I would like to introduce our host for today. First, we have Dr. James M. Johnson. He is the Executive Director of the Hudson River Valley Institute at Marist College and has taught history there since 2000 and is now serving as the Dr. Frank T. Bumpus Chair in the Hudson River Valley History. Author of Militia, Rangers, and Redcoats, co-compiler of America's First River, and co-editor of Key to the Northern Country, the Hudson River Valley and the American Revolution, Dr. Johnson graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1969 and served for 30 years in the U.S. Army, retiring as a colonel. Duke University awarded him a Master of Arts in History in 1977 and a Ph.D. in History in 1980. He received a second Master of Arts degree in National Security and Strategic Studies from the Naval War College in 1995. He commanded two field artillery bats batteries in Germany and Korea and taught for 15 years in two tours in the Department of History at West Point. In his second tour there, he headed the military history program, rising to the rank of Professor of History. Dr. Betsy Blakesley is the president of the not-for-profit Friends of the American Revolution at West Point. She received her BA at Marymount College in Tarrytown, her Master of Arts from DePaul University, and her PhD in American Studies from the University of Maryland. She was chair of the Mass Communications Department at Piedmont College in Georgia and has over 25 years experience in the telecommunications industry. Here are a few highlights from that uh, experience. Appointed by the Secretary of the Army, Betsy served as executive liaison for the Center for Total Access at Fort Gordon, coordinating civilian and military activities at the testbed for telemedicine applications in the battlefield. She served as the Executive Director of the National Commission on Workplace Learning and Technology under the Secretary of Labor. From 1992 to 1994, she was the Director at the Institute for Telemedicine at the Center for the New West in Denver, Colorado. And she was President and CEO of U.S. West Network Systems and the Director of Executive Leadership Development at U.S. West. Dr. Blakesley recently received the Gold Cross of Merit from President Karamowski of the Republic of Poland for her preservation work at West Point for both Kosciuszko's Garden and West Point's Revolutionary War fortifications. So with that impressive bit of experience between the two of them, I am now going to pass this over to Dr. Johnson to begin today's presentation. Thank you so much, Amanda. Good afternoon, all. I sit before you as Lieutenant James Johnston, Adjutant 5th New York. You can tell that because I'm wearing a brown coat with blue facings and my buttons are pewter and they have NY upon them. I hope that you all had a great 4th of July celebration. Remembering our fight for independence, we did too. I even got an extra jill of rum as part of that. The governor, General George Clinton said of me, that he's an exceeding good officer, a decent lad with good share of education. So I hope I will, lead, uh, I will be able to live up to what he said of me. So now I'm gonna change roles and just be Jim Johnson. 
Dr. Betsy Blakesley and I are really excited to be with you today. Uh, we're acting as couriers, a la Paul Revere and William Dawes. Uh, instead of saying the regulars are coming, the regulars are coming, we're saying that the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution is coming. Congress calls it the semi-quincentennial. If you look it up, the better term, I believe, is sesterscentennial. It's five years away, 2025, and we thought that it was a good time for you to start thinking about that. Uh, we're really happy with how many of you have joined us today out there in uh, Red Fox country. In addition, we've got family, friends, former students, interns, uh, and it's really great to have all of you with us. As a representative for all of you, I would like to introduce uh, the fact that we have the Hudson River Valley Institute Advisory Board Chair Alex Reese with us, members Margaret Brinkerhoff and Alan Miller, Lois Johnson, Dr. Colonel Don Blakesley, Allison Spear, and Craig Waters are here with us from the board of the Friends of the American Revolution. Uh, there are two um, shout out lines, two ringers, if you will, from West Point Museum Director David Reel and history professor Sean Scully. So welcome to all of you. The Hudson River Valley Institute supports the academic programs of Marist College, and we've really been excited to participate this spring and summer with these webinars. The very first uh, with our students, three Marist intern students, was called Regional History Writers on the Rise. If you missed that, you can watch the recording on YouTube. We're planning another session for early August with the Hudson River Valley Review authors Michael Matzler and Shannon Butler. So stay tuned for more information. We'll let you know as soon as we've worked those details out. As the academic arm of the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area and the recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Challenge grant, we study and promote the Hudson River Valley. Besides the website, conferences, and lectures, we publish the Hudson River Valley Review twice a year. This is the spring issue. I hope that there are a number of you are already subscribing. If you're not, we hope that you will become subscribers as you support Marist. We're really happy that in this issue, we have a topic relevant to West Point about the Great Chain by Charlie Dewey, and it's called Fluid Loyalism at the Forge, the Sterling Iron Works, and the American Revolution. So those are the introductions. I'm gonna focus my time on the strategic value of the Hudson River Valley in New York and Fortress West Point, which George Washington called the key of America, as you saw on the, the slide to start with. This is L'Enfant's panoramic view, as you see. Uh, if you're standing in garrison looking across to West Point today, it's pretty imposing where the United States Military Academy is, one of the greatest leadership development institutions in the world. But if you were standing there like these two gentlemen looking across at Fortress West Point, I think you would be equally amazed at the strength of that fortification. So I'm gonna focus on that. Betsy's then going to focus on the not-for-profit Friends of the American Revolution at West Point and what it's doing to preserve those fortifications as we approach the 250th anniversary. This is Villa Franche's plan of West Point. He was the engineer for the latter part of the war. The thing that's interesting is here in his plan, you actually see the chain. L'Enfant, in his uh, view, actually in 1782 did not show the chain. I don't know why that is. We should have seen it. It was done in August if it were in the river. But you can definitely see that in this picture, the chain is in the river, and as you will hear, it is central to what goes on in the fortifications. I thought I would answer one of the questions in advance that we received ahead of time, and that is what happened around Marist, Poughkeepsie, Hyde Park? Uh, from the log of the British Row Galley Independence, this took place in October of 1777, and I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for that. Once Sir Henry Clinton had taken Forts Clinton, Montgomery, Independence at Peekskill, Constitution on the 6th of October, 1777, 
He dispatched Major General John Vaughn with a force of 1,500 men up the Hudson, and he got as far as Robert R. Livingston's Claremont in Dutchess County. So here's how Vaughn troop, troops and Sir uh, James Wallace's sailors brought the war to our area in Marist. At 4 p.m., anchored with the best bower, that's an anchor, in 12 fathoms. Poughkeepsie, north by east, two miles. At 8 a.m., sent the boats on shore, manned and armed to burn two rebel vessels and some storehouses, fired two 24-pound shot and one four-pound shot. To cover the boats at 10, they returned, having completed what they were sent to do. Uh, I found out that the British fired cannons at Jacoba Stotenberg's house, and I think one of those cannonballs is still around in Hyde Park. So the real question then is, why were Vaughn's troops here in the Hudson River Valley? I've argued that the Hudson River Valley was the center of the American War of Independence. From a strategic perspective, it was the chief, chief seat, as they called it, or theater of the war. It had a world-class harbor, the second largest city in the colonies with, with 25,000 inhabitants, behind Philadelphia with its 38,000. The Hudson River was a route to Canada and to the Iroquois Confederation, future allies for the British, they hoped. Another interesting fact is at least as an estimate. Fact is maybe too hard to nail down. But in 1776, <clears throat> it is estimated that 50% of New Yorkers were loyalists, Tories, as they would be called. So for all those reasons, New York was really important. Now, Washington had to figure out what the British were going to do when they left Boston in March of 1776 and headed to Nova Scotia. And he anticipated that they would come to this important waterway, the Hudson, and to New York City. Washington had already, in effect, reconned this area in the French and Indian War. Because he visited the city of New York in the winter of 1756 on his way to Boston to ask for a commission from William Shirley, the commander-in-chief of British forces in North America. And he even came back, obviously, on his way from Boston back to Virginia, and then again in 1773 when he took his stepson John Park Custis to King's College, which is now Columbia. So he had seen the Hudson River, he had seen New York City, and had even been entertained by a guy who will be on the other side, the loyalist uh, Beverly Robinson. So he had already sensed a lot of the things that would come in handy when he was appointed as a delegate from Virginia to the committee to decide what to do about fortifying the Hudson River. After only 10 days, which is amazing in the terms of the way we think about Congress today, the Continental Congress accepted the committee's findings. This was on May the 25th, after it started on the 15th of May, and directed the New York Provincial Congress to erect batteries there in such manner as will most effectually prevent any vessels passing that may be sent to harass the inhabitants on the borders of said river. So the Continental Congress decided the Hudson River was the place to fortify, and they directed the New York Provincial Congress to do that. So the Hudson River Valley from the very beginning is really going to be uh, at the nexus of all of the kinds of things that will go on in the American Revolution. Troops will start here near West Point, across the river there, as you see when you're looking at Constitution Island. That will happen in the fall of 1775, Martelliers Rock. General Charles Lee will come to New York City in the spring of 1776 to begin to fortify it. The British will land at Staten Island on the 2nd of July, 1776, and will occupy Manhattan after winning the Battle of Long Island, Brooklyn, in August of 1776. And they're not going to, evalu uh, to evacuate New York until the 25th of November, 1783. And they will take with them 35,000 loyalists. Washington will spend a third of the war at or near the Hudson Highlands. And Continental troops would be with him or within several days' march with only a few exceptions, like the Philadelphia Campaign in 1776 and Yorktown Campaign in 1781. 
New York was second only to New Jersey in terms of engagements. New Jersey had 238, New York had 228 out of a total of 1,331 skirmishes and battles. All right, so that's why New York was so important, the Hudson River Valley and the Hudson River itself, also, as you see, called the North River. So, here's the map of West Point fortifications in 1780, which I will use over the course of the next few minutes. So why was the West Point of the Hudson chosen for the place to fortify? The reason is that two brothers-in-law were tasked by the New York Provincial Congress to go figure out the right spot. They were both residents of Ulster County. Christopher Tappan was from Kingston. Colonel James Clinton of the militia was from Little Britain. And they were told to go to the Highlands and view the banks of Hudson's River there and report to this Congress the most proper place for erecting one or more fortifications and likewise an estimate of the expense that will attend erecting the same. So from this beginning at Martelier's Rock as Constitution Fort would grow the Fortress West Point with 16 redoubts, small forts, or batteries and eight artillery batteries on both sides of the Hudson River. And this would be the thing, the place, the important spot that Benedict Arnold would then try to sell in September of 1780. So now let's figure out, and those of you that are looking at this map can follow along and think about this. The basic reason that West Point was chosen was the real estate true truism, location, location, location. You can notice on this map an S-shaped curve in the river. That is really a tough challenge for square rig sailing ships, particularly warships that would have to reset their sails. It's one of the narrowest parts in the river, 500 yards. The hills on both sides of the Hudson Highlands basically affect the wind. I think the Venturi effect is there for all of you mechanical engineers. A fluid that is in a restricted space moves at a faster velocity. I was aboard the HMS Rose, and we went from Poughkeepsie and to Alpine, and the the winds were so fickle that we never once actually sailed. We were under engine the entire time. So it's fickle, but it, when you get into the funnel-like area there around Constitution Island, it could it become a real effect. There's tide. Tide changes three to five feet at West Point. And of course, the current's always flowing from north to south. Uh, that makes it an estuary as a tidal uh, body of water. And just, oh, by the way, it's a fjord because it's at sea level. Uh, when you think about the height of the walkway over the Hudson when you're on it, that's 212 feet. The deepest part in the Hudson called World's End is right between Constitution Island at West Point, and that's 202 feet. So that gives you a real sense of how much the glacier carved out around Constitution Island. So I mentioned that Washington said that West Point was the key of America. He said that in his sentiments on a peace establishment in 1783. He argued that the defense of the fortifications was just critical to the outcome of the war. And he would never lose sight of that fact over the, t the period of time that he was the commander in chief. So let's explore the fortifications at West Point. So we'll start with this map, and we'll see if I can drag that. I'm not sure that that's showing that. I'm trying to point at this, but I don't think it's actually working. Um, but look at the west point of the Hudson that's, in, that's jutting out into the river, and that gives you the start point. Near there is Fort Arnold and Fort Clinton, just to get you oriented. In early 1778, French Colonel Louis de la Radiere traced out what would become Fort Clinton Arnold. He would also trace on his first sketch Sherman's Redoubt and four water batteries along the bank of the Hudson River below. Polish engineer Colonel Thaddeus Kosciuszko supervised the construction of these works and 
in the initial plan after Washington reassigned Lerati here. He, by the way, would die for our cause of consumption and would be buried in the Windsor. Uh, no one's found his grave. With the help of Captain Thomas Mason, Kosciuszko oversaw the stretching of the Great Chain across 500 yards from West Point to Constitution Island on 30 April 1778. Wash, this chain weighed some 35 tons and floated on rafts of 50-foot white pine logs. It really became the central feature of the fortification. And in your map, you also see that there is a boom in place in front of the chain to help slow a ship down and tangle it in at work so cannons on both sides could fire upon it. That may have been in the river only once. It's very hard to really figure that out. So from 1778 to 80, Colonel Kosciuszko added nine additional redoubts, small forts, four forts, including Fort Putnam, to the two Laradier's plan to complete the sophisticated defenses. Laradier would then pass on the French baton to Lieutenant Colonel Jean-Baptiste de Gouvion, who would be Kosciuszko's assistant. Kosciuszko will leave on the 7th of August, 1780, and his replacement for the remainder of the war was the Chevalier de Villafranche, and you've already seen one of his drawings. So now let's figure out the fortifications themselves. This is how the parapets of these forts, these redoubts, would have been constructed. You're going to see in the pictures that I'm going to show you here in just a minute that in almost all of the works at West Point, the foundation, the scarp, was actually done with stone. Uh, Dr. Blakesley will talk just a little bit about that at Fort Meigs. But what you're gonna see here, and what you do see in this, in this drawing, is that wooden structures were then built on top of the foundation. You would then have two walls, and between the two walls you could put rubble and dirt, and that would then absorb cannon balls. Uh, at the very bottom, you see fascines, bundles of sticks, which would have been the other alternative to finish off the top. And once you then had dirt in place, you could put sod there in order to preserve and cut down on the kind of maintenance required. So we'll start at Constitution Fort, Fort Constitution. This is Bernard Roman's battery. Roman's was a Dutch cartographer, botanist, and civil engineer. His civil engineering capability is very evident here because you see here that he built things that are still there today. He was not a very good military engineer. He tried to read that from a book. He had to keep being pushed to the east by committees that were coming to see what was going on. And he had failed to take into consideration the further east he was the better he could take British ships under fire as soon as they became evident in the river. So this is where it started. This is redoubt number seven. This was placed in the second round of fortifications, 1778-1779. This overlooks West Point, and this also had a powder magazine in it from 1782. To 1783. This is the Great Chain. If you go to West Point, you will be able to view the chain you see on the left. There are 13 links, two and a quarter inch bar iron, about 105 pounds of each link. Also, there is a clevis which allowed you to take the chain apart into about 10 to 12 links for ease of uh, moving it, although ease doesn't really work too well. And then there's also a swivel which allowed it to be flexible with both tight and current. Uh, when we did the 225th anniversary of the floating of the chain in 2003, we actually, Lois and I, built this one section. West Point uh, construction crews actually did the chain, and Amy Matheson Hagen's father, in fact, built the swivel and the clevis for this. Then, using the miracle of electronics, we were able to make it look like it went across the river. So you see now what the chain would have looked like had it actually been, uh, if it actually was in place today. This is Fort Clinton, Fort Arnold. <clears throat> you can see that this was a massive citadel fort. It was over 550 yards in circumference. 
It had a 35 foot deep uh, ditch, <clears throat> excuse me, and it also was something like 180 feet above the Hudson. So this was really the central point for the defenses of the fortifications themselves. This is Fort Putnam. This overlooked the plain where the uh, Fort Arnold, Fort Clinton was. This is on Crown Hill, and this was built by Colonel Rufus Putnam and his 5th Massachusetts Regiment. And this had cannons that would have then protected the rear of Fort Arnold and Fort Clinton. All right, my slide seems to not change. Okay, there we go. Um, so, it's now my turn to turn this over to Dr. Blakesley, and she will bring you up to date on what we're doing as we prepare for the 250th anniversary. Betsy, Dr. Blakesley. Amanda, can you please thank you? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Blakesley. Okay. Uh, full disclosure, my husband is, was an Army doctor up until about a month ago at West Point. Uh, we were stationed there for the past 10 years. And um, in, he was class of 1970. Jim is actually class of 1969. And when we came to West Point, uh, Jim spent a lot of time trying to convince me that I should walk outside my quarters and look at the fortification remains at West Point, which I thought at the time was rather boring and that I wasn't really interested in that. So uh, Jim and Lois and Don and I were stationed together in the artillery when my husband and Jim were in the artillery in 1971 and uh, have been friends for all these many years. All right, what I wanna to talk to you about today is my journey to understand the significance of the fortifications of West Point. And to let you know that it was only through the understanding of the fortifications there that I really began to comprehend the American Revolution. So I'm hoping that I can provide some of that um, process to you as we go through the slides today. So Jim, if you will um, just shift to the next slide. What you're looking at right now is Fort Putnam, which is a large um, fort at West Point that was actually put back together and reinforced for the bicentennial. And um, it was put back um, using mortar, um, which was not how it was constructed originally, because all of the fortifications were put together in dry stone stacking, which was a very particular expertise at the time. And it's quite extraordinary that today we have over 30 sites at West Point that are um, still in existence from 1778, if you will. So uh, we've got a great opportunity to save these fortifications. And that's the mission of the Friends of the American Revolution at West Point. So after I finally decided that I would go out and look at these fortifications with Jim just outside the door of our quarters at West Point, I became intrigued by their significance. And um, I wanted to learn, of course, more about the role of West Point. I, I had a general idea about Benedict Arnold and the fact that he was trying to sell the fortifications at West Point to the British for the equivalent of about a million dollars in today's dollars. That was really the extent of my understanding of their significance. Um, after working with several garrison commanders at West Point over a period of a couple of years, um, we were encouraged to start a 501c3 which when I looked at the application form to create a 501c3 um, seemed a bit daunting. Uh, we had to be approved by 
West Point itself, there are very few 501c3 organizations that are approved at West Point. We had to be approved by the Pentagon. We had to be approved by the federal government. We had to be approved by the state of New York. And um, we had to be approved by the education rules that govern um, organizations in the state of New York. So we had about two years of going through a very arduous process to be able to actually be a voice because this is a private and public partnership to save these fortifications, which only have about 20 years left in them before they're going to disappear from the face of the earth probably. So we, there are over 30 sites as I indicated and our organization is a private organization, 501c3, that works in partnership with West Point and the federal government to publicize the significance of the fortification system. So we're, um, that's who we are, and we have to renew our application to West Point every two years, just to make sure that we're following all of the rules. Um, do you see here Fort Putnam? It was built on the high ground. Um, there's a similarity between this fort and the fort that Jim was just describing to you, which was down on the West Point, if you will. And um, this was Kostyusko's idea of building on the high ground. Kostyusko had been sort of a wanderer coming from Poland. He had been studying at the um, Royal Military Academy, actually auditing classes in France, and he had already graduated from the Polish Military Academy. Um, and he ended up being um, recruited along with other French engineers when Benjamin Franklin sent Silas Dean over to see if we could locate some engineers because we didn't have any in our army. So, um, Kostiusko built this particular fortification on the high ground, but, and later we will look at a fort that he built even higher than this. He was very, very um, obsessed about um, building on the high ground, and he um, was also um, the person who had been building on the high ground at Saratoga. Um, so he had proven himself by indicating that if they didn't build on the high ground at Saratoga, they weren't going to win that battle. Of course, they won that battle, and that battle meant that the French would um, join in um, assisting us in the American Revolution. So slide number, so the next slide, Jim, if you just move on to that. Jim, yeah. Thank you so much. This is readout four. Readout four is, is an extraordinary site that has um, several remnants and um, it of, of the original fort. It, this is the most extraordinary view that you can have of the fortifications system at West Point. And we are hoping to, when we, once we get this put back together, that you will be able to um, um, see this fortification as a general public, and that you will be able to, oh, sorry, and that you will be able to um, comprehend or see the broad expanse of the whole fortification system. So, moving to the next slide, Jim. This, this is a, a slide that's a picture of um, cadets that are working on a historic element at Kostiusko's Garden. Kostiusko's Garden is the um, oldest, one of the oldest continuously existing gardens in America. And we went about restoring this garden with the assistance of AOG, which is the Association of Graduates, and with the assistance of the class of 1970 um, West Pointers. This um, uh, group of senior capstone students 
worked very hard to get this whole platform done. But because of the COVID and pan COVID pandemic, then um, they had to stop. So it'll be completed by a set of cadets next year who will complete that. I, I would suggest to you that if you want to read kind of a good overview of the significance of Fortress West Point, I would read Nathaniel Philbrick's book, Valiant Ambition, which was published about two years ago. And it gives you the whole sweep of the interaction between George Washington and Benedict Arnold, kind of from the beginning, and really highlights the significance of the fortification system. Also, if you can get your hands on it, The River and the Rock is a great book to read by <clears throat> General Palmer, who was the superintendent at West Point and who is on the advisory board of the Friends of the American Revolution. Um, there's a memorial to Kosciuszko that the cadets chose to honor in 1828. And the reason that they chose to honor Kosciuszko on the plane um, at the request of General Sylvanus Thayer, who said they could pick anyone they wanted to, um, they would, um, they picked this individual, Kosciuszko, because of his support for human rights for many people. When Kosciuszko left the United States and went back to um, Poland after serving eight years in the American Revolution and being promoted ultimately at the end to general and becoming a U.S. citizen as well as a citizen of Poland, he, he went back and helped to write only the second um, de democratic constitution um, for Poland because they were trying to prevent them, they were trying to prevent the Prussians and the Russians from attacking the um, Poland and dividing it up. Of course, that didn't work out too well. Um, the class of 70 has also um, assisted in, in providing lots of funds to make all of this happen. If you'll go to the next slide, please. What you're looking at is a view from what is called Fort Miggs. This is one of the um, fortifications at West Point. And I was asked um, this year to help West Point to be a participant along with uh, Lois Johnson, who's on our board, to kind of imagine what West Point itself, the military academy, would be like in the future if you could get everything that you wanted to build or to construct. So it was interesting because one of the things that they talked about was the protection of the view sheds and how would they identify which were the most important view sheds to protect at West Point. And it occurred to me with kind of a flash that the best view sheds at West Point were all the fortification sites that had been designed by Kosciuszko. Obviously, because what you needed was to be able to see if the British were coming from the south if, if, on the river. You would also have to see if the British were coming from the north on the river. And um, you would also have to be able to see them coming by land if, in fact, that was the way that they were going to attack West Point. We know a lot more now about how Benedict Arnold was going to set up West Point to be taken by the British. And um, it had everything in the world to do with making sure that these um, fortification sites were kind of dismantled. And then um, Benedict Arnold was going to indicate to the soldiers on the day that he was going to hand this over to the British that they needed to leave their fortification sites and go outside the fort to be able to defend the incoming British. The idea being that once he got these soldiers to leave the fortification sites and go out to these outlying areas, there would be a clear path for the British to basically be able to just walk into West Point and take it over. And this whole story, which is fascinating, is told quite well by Nathaniel Philbrook in his book, Valiant Ambition. 
So Pastusko had always, he was deeply affected by having worked with African Americans and seen what was happening in the South to African Americans at West Point. And he was deeply affected because it reminded him greatly of the situation with the poor serfs of Poland. So he had worked very hard once he went back to Poland to try to f free all of those people as well. It's very significant and a lot of people don't know this story. But when um, Kostiusko died, he left in his will to his friend, Thomas Jefferson, all the money that he earned in the American Revolution so that Jefferson would free and educate his slaves. And that didn't happen. But Kosciuszko knew that if Jefferson had done that, it would have changed the course of American history. So um, that's a, an important and significant reason why Kosciuszko, a lot of people know Kosciuszko from the Kosciuszko in properly pronounced bridge in New York. But um, his significance is much farther reaching um, than one might imagine. Okay, next slide, please, Jim. So this is our first experiment with bringing in experts from the Dry Stone Conservancy who had actually um, come to West Point at our behest, the behest of the Friends of the American Revolution in partnership with the um, Association of Graduates to see if we couldn't put back a parapet, Jim, Jim has really helped me, Dr. Johnson, I must add, because it took me about three years of calling these walls before Jim had convinced me that I needed to call them parapets. And of course, I'm much better at that, thanks to Jim. So what we were able to do with the Dry Stone Conservancy, and they are experts in this kind of putting back together historic walls, they were able to come in and harvest the original stones that had been used in the wall from all the way down the hill on both sides of this fortification. And they were able to identify through several very interesting ways of their expertise, which stone should go where. And so they were able to put this back very, very closely to where these stones had been. And we have determined in our work with restoring all these fortifications, that we will restore the fortifications to the degree that we have the stones lying around that were original to the fortifications. So for example, in some of the fortifications, we might only have enough stones to build one or two walls, but we will indicate where the additional walls were with graphic, graphic signage at all of these locations. In addition, um, the history, um, the American History Department at um, West Point, which is under the leadership of um, Colonel Sean Scully. And um, it's very interesting. Uh, the Army is a small world. Sean's father is a classmate of my husband. But Sean is an expert in the American Revolution. And um, he had his students, has had his students for several years in partnership with the Computer Science Electrical Engineering Department and the Civil Engineering Department work on creating a virtual representation of what the fortification looked like at the time. So when we get these completed, you will be able to with your iPhone or with your um, iPad stand here looking at this wall and see the uh, uh, fascines that were constructed out of twigs and dirt and soil, et cetera, that would of course have eroded over time um, very quickly actually. You're going to be able to see how it was structured at every one of these fortifications. So we're going to be able to put together everything that is able to be put together. And then um, Colonel Scully's um, students and class are, classes going forward are going to be able to allow us to virtually see what all those structures were. 
Um, I've learned a lot about historic preservation in working on this project, and especially from Dr. Johnson. But you have to be very, and the cultural resources officers at West Point, um, Patrick Raley and Paul Hudson, and the garrison commander, you have to be very careful not to turn something like this into, quote, Disneyland. What we want to do is to maintain the integrity of the fortifications using the same stones that were used, getting it back as much as we possibly can, and then at having the um, use of uh, artificial intelligence and other fascinating new forms of um, uh, computer science to have you be able to see the thing as it was actually with the soldiers in it and be able to see the views that you would have seen from a specific site. Um, so moving on from that, uh, oh, and also the civil engineering um, cadets from the Civil Engineering Department, these are all senior capstone projects, created a viewing platform because part of our objective is to have every one of these sites be welcoming to people who live in the West Point community and visitors who are um, accompanied. They, they'll be able to sit and enjoy this space and learn about the history of this space and why it's so significant. So it'll be a great place for them to be able to bring their children, to be able to you know, have a picnic, et cetera, at each fortification um, location at West Point. Um, so the next slide, please, Jim. And this is um, very meaningful, <laughs> especially given everything that's happening. Um, right now in America relative um, to Black Lives Matter. And believe me, when it comes to Fortress West Point, Black lives really matter. And this has been one of the most extraordinary things that I have learned as we have gone through this process. So what you're looking at here is called a maquette. This is a miniature version of a sculpture um, that would be hopefully um, put up in full size somewhere at West Point. But the maquette itself has been presented to the superintendent and is, um, being, is located in the West Point Library. The sculpture of this um, scene between Kosciusko and Agrippa Hull, who I'll, I will talk to you about in a minute, was done by Tracy Subs. She's a very renowned um, sculptor in America. She has another sculpture in the West Point Library as well. And we only, and you're, you're looking at, um, her, her dad was um, class of 70 with my husband, um, wounded and highly decorated soldier from the Vietnam War. And this is his daughter who has done this. So you're looking at Kosciusko with the grip of hull. And I'm going, this was presented to the superintendent um, in, in the past month by the Friends of the American Revolution. And the um, inscription on it reads, in August of 1780, Private Agrippa Hull delivers to his commanding officer, Colonel Thaddeus Kosciusko, an important letter from George Washington in Kosciusko's garden. And that is a garden that we have restored, which was built by Kosciusko himself in 1778, just as a place of reflection. One of the first African-American soldiers to serve at West Point, Continental Soldier Hull served as an orderly in the War for Independence for six years, including the battles of Ticonderoga and Saratoga at Valley Forge and Fortress West Point, and the battles of Monmouth Courthouse, Cowpens, Guilford Courthouse, 96, and Utah Springs, making him eligible for the badge of distinction. At the end of the war, General George Washington honorably discharged Agrippa Hull at Fortress West Point. And there's a fascinating and remarkable stories about the significance of this individual and his relationship to Kosciusko and the fact that he went on to be a very successful landowner in Massachusetts and um, just an extraordinary individual. 
so the the other thing that I would like to point out to you is that at the presentation to the superintendent, we were able to um, identify for him, and I will tell you that General Darrell Williams is the first African American superintendent to serve at West Point, and he is the cur current superintendent. So one other really wonderful thing that has come from this exploration of all of this. Um, all of these um, historical documents. And I, I do have to say kudos to um, Dr. Johnson, to a member of our board, Kevin Raymond, and to a consultant that we have hired with experience in digital archiving from the Smithsonian. They have transcribed so far 10 orderly books that were written by soldiers at West Point at the time of the American Revolution, which have never been transcribed before and will be available to people through the USMA library site. So we have, for example, a comment in one of those orderly books, yesterday was treachery of the blackest dye when our commander, General Arnold, of course, performed his treasonous act. Just extraordinary. One of the other things that's happened in this process has been really remarkable. There's a, there was a senior, of course, I mentioned to you Colonel Scully, who is an expert in all of these areas of the American Revolution and, prime, and, and a great expert about Fortress West Point. He had a student who did a project for his senior capstone now this student, Cadet Gerstenfeld, is the captain of the US MA hockey team. And his senior capstone was to look at Fort Miggs and try to ascertain as much as possible who was there and who constructed this and, and everything you could possibly learn about that. And I'll just read to you um, that he, Cadet Gerstenfeld, was able to identify in primary documents proving that 37 African-American soldiers served in the 6th Connecticut Regiment. And we can surmise that they helped to build Fort Miggs because each one of these fortifications were built by a separate regiment and they were named for the you know, commander of that particular regiment. So Miggs was the commander of, of Miggs um, fortification. He has laid the groundwork for a methodology for us to find out even more African-American patriots who served in other regiments at Fortress West Point. And we think that we are going to be able to uncover just a tremendous amount of um, historical information that hasn't been um, presented before. So in conclusion, I would say that the Friends of the American Revolution works with lots of different folks at West Point. Um, we work with the Center for Military History in Washington, D.C., who's in charge of all of the military museums in the world, the American military museums. And they are assisting us in um, helping to do research and um, to position Fortress West Point for the 250th anniversary as a way to commemorate the American soldiers from the revolution. Being in all these primary documents is just extraordinary because you find out what horrendous challenges they had to live in with very little food, very few supplies, and um, no uniforms, essentially. You know, I had always read about Valley Forge and I, of course, was taken by how tragic it was, the condition of the American soldiers. But when you live at a place like this and you spend your time in these fortifications, you gain a reverence for that commitment, which is just indescribable, quite frankly. And I, every day that I'm at West Point, I'm grateful for what they have done to make it possible for us to have this democracy that we have. So if you would like more information about the Fortress West Point project, or you have additional 
information or research that you might have that we could learn from, we'd love to have you contact us. And I think they're going to put the email address up on the um, slide here some, so that you would be able to do that. So thank you so much. I'm so honored to work on this project. We're going to deliver to the garrison commander in about three weeks the entire strategic plan for just exactly what can be done at every single fortification, given the amount of original rocks and materials that we have. And we're working with an organization where our lead person who does this is from Scotland, and he spends two or three months in Europe reconstructing castles and important sites in Europe and then three or four months here in America doing um, historical sites that require this kind of expertise here. So we're very proud of that. We're very excited about doing that. We're very grateful to everyone who's helped us so far and we just want as many people as possible to know about this and to understand how significant Fortress West Point is to the history of the American Revolution and all that it is in this democracy that we are so fortunate to live in. Thank you very much. Amanda, in the interest yeah. of time, I will answer quickly the three questions that we got ahead of time, and then we'll see what else we can do in a couple of minutes. Sure. Uh, I took care of the question about what happened in the Marist uh, area that was basically British cannonballs fired in the Hyde Park, Poughkeepsie area. Uh, the next question was, did Major Talmadge, who was uh, in the spy system of George Washington, as well as a light dragoon commander, ever visit West Point? Yes, he did. In fact, the most notable time was when he escorted Major John Andre en route to Tapan where he would be hanged as a spy. Uh, another interesting fact about Major Talmadge is that his son, George Washington Talmadge, uh, became a cadet and graduated from West Point. Uh, the third question was, where did the soldiers come from that served in the North and Middle Redoubts on the eastern side of the Hudson? All the soldiers that served around West Point were in the Highlands Department. So basically the same soldiers were tasked out to various sites within the department, which included Fishkill Supply Depot, uh, all the way down to what was called uh, the lines along the Croton River. So Amanda, those are the three questions that we got ahead of time. If we have time for maybe one, you're the boss, so whatever you say. Yeah, I'll shoot you and Bessie both, I think, relatively easy questions. The first for you, Jim, since you're kind of already on a roll. Betsy mentioned some readings that she suggested for future further information. Um, do you have any books or articles or sites that you can recommend on further reading on the history of the Hudson River Valley during the Revolution? Yes, yeah, so Betsy gave you two uh, great ideas, River in the Rock by General Palmer and Valiant Ambition. So those are two. There's another book that's called Chaining the Hudson by mm -hmm. uh, an author that looked at Diamond. the chain, mm -hmm. Lincoln, Lincoln Diamond. Mm -hmm. And that looks at the chain in particular, the great chain. And a, a very interesting appendix covers all the, the, the fake pieces that were sold as if they were part of the chain. Uh, if you hold on a couple of more years, and I hear my wife laughing in the background, my book will be out and then you can read some more. <laughs> Highlands Fortress will get finished maybe even quicker because of the confinement of the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you, Betsy. Quick question for you. Um, in terms of the celebration um, itself, yes. what kind of recreated presence will be presented? Um, and someone specifically asked, will Fort Putnam once again be occupied? A uh, great question, and I love to give you this answer. So, in, in during the time that General Washington was commanding the troops, of course, he he lived at West Point for a four month period, but he was always very close, as Jim indicated, to West Point in Newburgh, etc. So, 
with the birth of the Dauphin of France, uh, General Washington and General Knox decided to have a big party on the plain at West Point. And they had 500 people, a, a lot of them as many French diplomats as they could get, to honor the birth of the Dauphin of France, because obviously we owed the French a lot. They built a um, structure on the plain, temporary structure on the plain at West Point, uh, that was about half the size of a football field. They festooned it with um, muskets and um, flags and um, flowers and all kinds of things. We know what they ate. We know the music that they danced to because General Washington, for those of you who didn't know, was a very avid dancer and enjoy doing that. So he and Mrs. Knox and General Knox led the dancing for the entire evening. At the end of that evening, they shot off at every single fortification site. And you do need to know there are three of them over in Putnam County as well. And on, of course, many on Constitution Island and throughout West Point. They shot off fireworks, and artillery from every single fortification site. So for the 250th anniversary, we are going to recreate that party on the plane in the spirit of that party. And we will be shooting off, hopefully some form of artillery and fireworks from every single um, segment. And we think that this will be um, just a, a wonderful culmination. And I'm sure it will get a lot of press um to acknowledge the importance of Fortress West Point in the American Revolution. That's just one part of it. But it is under consideration now to be the gift from the Army to the nation. One important thing to think about is that Fortress West Point predates the military academy. Fortress West Point is 1776, I guess you would say. Uh, we're going to go with 75. We'll go yeah, with 75. Sorry, sorry, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and it continued um, right up until when the military academy was put there in 1802. So it's the oldest fort, um, you know, army fort in existence in the country, continuously existing. And um, so it's a it's a great opportunity for for Americans to celebrate West Point before the advent of the military academy. In other words, we we all own the significance of Fortress West Point and its importance in the American Revolution. And then, of course, it has created the baseline of the um, ongoing leadership academy at at West Point. Uh, one other aspect of that, David Reel was on here from the museum. He has been the steward of Fort Putnam for the whole time that he has been at the uh, museum. Uh, unfortunately, manpower is an issue even when we're not shut down for this pandemic. But we have put that into our overall plan. <clears throat> it will be part of the uh, preservation campaign uh, to build on what David has already done. And we hope that maybe with uh, tours onto the post, people will actually be able to see uh, reenactors and others upon special occasions at Fort Putnam. Yeah, David, uh, David Real has just been, I mean, he has extraordinary uh, pieces from the American Revolution in the Army Museum, which I encourage all of you to go and visit um, in Highland Falls, just outside of West Point. And uh, just one of our other very critical partners in making this preservation happen. So Amanda, over to you. Great, thank you. In consideration of everyone's time, I'm gonna wrap it up. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and keeping the Marist Alumni Association in your life. Also special thanks to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Blakely for spending time with us and sharing their experience and expertise. I know we didn't get to every single question that came in, so if you do have additional questions for Betsy and the Friends of the American Revolution at West Point, you can send an email, um, and I'm going to drop the email for both um, Betsy and 
um, HRVI into the chat box so everyone has that information. Um, also, a full recording of this presentation will be available, available in a few days on the Virtual Opportunities page on the Marist Alumni website. Um, and I'm going to post that link as well as a link to where you can find other upcoming events that we have. Um, and that is all I have for you guys this evening. So I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. And to all of you who participated and to Alumni Relations, three chairs, hip, hip, pizza, hip, hip, pizza, hip, hip, pizza.